What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of My Other Passion. I'm Ernest Baker, Editor-in-Chief of Front Office Sports, and today we have the CEO of McLaren Racing, Zach Brown, joining us on the show. Zach has a long history in motorsports. He grew up in California in the 1980s, where he saw the Long Beach Grand Prix and decided he wanted to be a race car driver. He did that for a bit, and then ultimately, one thing led to another, and he wound up on the business side. Now, today, he is at the helm of one of the most beloved racing brands in the world. We had an amazing conversation about McLaren, about his drivers, about how Formula One is blowing up in the U.S., and everything in between. We're going to take a quick break and hear from our partners over at Oracle NetSuite, and then we will be right back with Zach. 2000, 2008, 2022. When it comes to the economy, those are some scary years. First, you had the dot-com crash and the housing crash and whatever roller coaster we're going through right now. One thing is certain, it's a dangerous time not to know your numbers, but over 31,000 businesses have the confidence and clarity they need because they rely on NetSuite by Oracle, the number one cloud financial system. NetSuite gives you the visibility and control that you need over your financials, inventory, HR, planning, budgeting, everything that you need to manage risk, get reliable forecasts, improve margins, and the best thing about it, it's all in one place. So when you're trying to prepare for uncertain times, just remember, it's an easy answer NetSuite. This is what's going to help you identify rising costs, automate business processes, and ultimately just see where to save money. 93% of customers say they improve their visibility and control when they upgrade it to NetSuite. So what are you waiting for? Right now, NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind flexible financing program. All you got to do is head over to NetSuite.com slash MyOtherPassion. Go there right now. NetSuite.com slash MyOtherPassion. Take advantage of this offer see what you can do for your business. Zach, welcome to the show. How you doing, man? Good to be here, but I'm sorry to tell you the Cardinals are way better than the Dodgers. Is that how you feel? That's definitely how. It's a fact. Well, you know what? I, I always get into trouble when I wear this hat because I'm from Chicago, man. I'm a Sox guy. Well, I'm in LA, so I like the Dodgers, but Cardinals are my team. Yeah, see, I know I I live out in LA too, so it's like I represent for the city. I have love for them. It was fun riding around with my kids in 2020 honking the horn like my dad used to do when we win the Bulls championships back in the day. But at the end of the day, my heart is in Chicago sports. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, that's part of uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you. I mean, you are the CEO of McLaren Racing. I know that you are, you know, do a lot of work in, in your family is in the United Kingdom, but you grew up in California. You were born in L.A., right? Yeah, I'm a Valley boy. Born, I'm, born and raised in North Hollywood. I'm, I'm literally at Cahuenga and Magnolia right now. I was cold water in Magnolia, so not very far away. Oh, that's crazy! No, this yeah. literally my stomping grounds. The cold water. There's a Gelson's right there right now. Yeah. I don't know if it was that back in the day. Yeah, it certainly was. Okay, that's on Riverside, I think was it not? No, the Gelson's is. It might be, but either way. That whole, this is, this is, we're in the same exact area. Like, you know, um, you know, my kids go to school around here, you know, there's the whole, the whole North Hollywood thing and then going down to Ventura and Studio City and all that. So, so you can inspire me then since I'm over here in the Valley right now, how does one wind up becoming, uh, you know, the big boss of McLaren and, and, and just lots like, of air miles, lots of air miles. Yeah, I, um, you know, born and raised in, in, in L.A., the Valley, and I went to school out there when I went to school and I uh, got started in, in racing out there. My first race was the uh, 1981 Long Beach Grand Prix that we went to as a family and I was 10 years old and fell in love with cars. Then I remember it like it was yesterday. And then in uh, high school. A uh, buddy of mine, his family was in racing. We went to the 1987 Long Beach Grand Prix, and then that's when I decided I wanted to try and become a professional racing driver. I had uh, been on Wheel of Fortune Teen Week, which is an unusual way to get into racing, but won a bunch of his and her watches, which I sold at a pawn shop in uh, in the Valley, which you probably need to be over 18 to do that, but uh, I seemed to sneak out of there with some cash. And uh, bought a go kart, and uh, that's how I started uh, racing. And then uh, been uh, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, as the saying goes. Um, kind of school of hard knocks because uh, I didn't have anyone uh, in my family in racing, and uh, that would have been '87. And then end of 2016, ended up here uh, in this awesome job of running McLaren. Did you, have you seen Licorice Pizza? I have not. 
Doesn't sound very good, though. <laughs> well, it, you remind me. It's like it's um, Paul Thomas Anderson's sort of like love letter to the Valley, and and the guy, the main character, is like a young hustler Valley kid, like doing stuff like how you said selling to the pawn shop. He's like selling water beds and running around. But uh, you should check it out. It kind of sounds a little bit like your origin story. Um, All right, I'll, I'll check it out. <laughs> but yeah, you know, I've always wondered with motorsports. Um, did you? There's a lot, like, like, for instance, I, I had a conversation, obviously NASCAR is a bit different, but I was speaking with Bubba Wallace a few months back uh, about how he got into everything. And, you know, he was just talking about so much of it is family. I also went out to the Daytona 500, um, definitely have a lot more F1 that I want to do. Some of our other writers, like, went to Miami, went to Austin and stuff. But I think regardless, throughout motorsports, it's a lot of family. It's a lot of legacy. It's a lot of, like, you're born into it. So, was it it sounds like it was a bit of an uphill battle for you to get in without that precedent like how exactly did you cut through like i you know i've done my research i see you had your success in karting and then that carries on but it's also just very expensive like you know how how did you get to that point where i think by the mid 90s you know you're starting your own business and then able to carry it into the next levels of your career but i imagine there were some challenges uh, lots of challenges and still challenges uh, to this day, uh, different challenges than, than uh, when getting started. Um, yeah, I didn't have any uh, kind of background in, in sponsorships and raising money, and I didn't have uh, uh, the family wherewithal to fund my racing career like, like, like many, many have. So I had to figure out how to uh, put together sponsorship and what I, I kind of stumbled on, and I say stumbled because it wasn't a, a, a business plan or a, a formal education around it, was I needed sponsorship to race. And I just kind of figured out uh, what do I have to give a corporation in order for them to sponsor me so I could race. And I kind of still very much take that uh, kind of philosophy with me to this day with our, our current corporate partners at, at McLaren, which is... You know, I need something from you to help me go motor racing, but you're only going to give that to me if I give you something that you feel is very valuable uh, to you. And th that's how I learned sponsorship was by getting very in tune with whoever was sponsoring me or sponsoring us today, understanding what do they, you know, they got a lot of different places they can spend money. If they're going to spend money, what type of return do they need? What are they trying to do to grow their business? So I became a TWA, the airline, was uh, my, my biggest sponsor in my early career. And I became kind of a, a marketing expert on TWA and frequent flyer miles. They wanted to sign people up or they had new first class seats and they wanted people to you know, be able to demonstrate first class seats and they wanted to uh, motivate employees at the at the airport everything from pilots to uh, luggage room and, and everything in between and maintenance and they wanted to uh, build their brand internationally and so just by being very inquisitive and understanding you know TWA what are you trying to do to grow your business I then just figured out how could they use motorsports to do those things. So we have hundreds of thousands of people at the racetrack. So we could sign up people for frequent flyers. And if they sat in, you know, simulated first class seats, we'd give them double mileage and then we get rental car companies and hotels that there were partners with involved. And I spent a ton of time in St. Louis Airport, which was their uh, their hub in visiting the, the maintenance department and talking about racing and motivating. And so this is very much what we do uh, to this day, which is understand what are our partners trying to do with their business? How can a partnership with McLaren help them drive their business forward? Yeah, I love the the business part of it. And like, I think that's really where you're coming from as a CEO, your expertise. I mean, so much front office sports, we're a business publication. So, you know, of course we all, the races are exciting. We love the athletes. We love to see how that's going, but we're, we're very much into, you know, the investment in media, the sponsorships, like everything. When you see this trajectory that formula one is on, especially in the U S so being at the helm of that, we're talking decades later now. It's we're far removed from TWA. You know, you're you're sitting, you know, at the top seat of 
you know, one of the most recognizable brands and racing brands in the world. Um, so I'm sure that there's some things that are similar, but, you know, a lot has changed in that time. What do you find are the business goals for McLaren Racing? And uh, ultimately, like, how are you able to contribute? What's your vision? What are you trying to accomplish? And I also wonder, you know, what is like McLaren from a consumer standpoint want out of this? You know, is there some type of relationship between, you know, someone who loves the team and even though the cars are certainly, you know, pretty exclusive to a certain uh, income bracket, but just how does all that work uh, from a business standpoint? Cause I think most people, you know, look at you and they think about the team as they should, but we want to know a bit about how the business runs and, and your perspective on it. Yep. A absolutely. So our uh, shareholders, McLaren racing is uh, a different business than our McLaren automotive uh, we have uh, one big common uh, shareholder, uh, McLaren Group, which owns uh, automotive and 70% of McLaren uh, Racing. Uh, uh, my fellow CEO literally sits uh, right across the, uh, the way from me. So we work very, very uh, closely together. Ultimately, my, my remit at McLaren Racing is to win races and championships, uh, drive a profitable business, and uh, you know, continue to build on this great brand uh, that we have. So those are kind of the, our, the three things that I wake up doing uh, every day. I think a lot of uh, McLaren Automotive's customers uh, love our, our racing heritage uh, and, and vice versa. Um, of course, younger generation, it's, it's very aspirational that maybe one day they can be in a uh, uh, in a McLaren because it's not uh, uh, an inexpensive uh, purchase. Uh, we work very uh, closely uh, together. Uh, they're great for our racing brand, and, and I think our racing brand is great for for their automotive businesses. There's certain parts of the world um, we're the famous brand, and then there's certain parts of the world they're the famous uh, brand. So it's it's a great uh, relationship between the two. Uh, businesses we share this great great brand and um you know there's kind of four things that make us go round and round that are all equally as important to have a successful uh business that is one being a great place to to work we're a sports team so it's a high performance uh culture uh two we're all about our our fans without our fans there is no motor racing. There are no sponsors, uh, et cetera. So we, you know, very much pay attention to our, our engaging with our fans. Uh, three, helping us build our, our corporate partners' business. Um, otherwise, they they won't partner with McLaren. So, you know, waking up every day thinking about how can we help Google and Dell and Coca Cola and Goldman Sachs and these great companies and brands that we're affiliated with. And then the last is, is sustainability and how can we use our uh, technology know-how, the microphone our drivers have to contribute to making the world and, and the environment uh, a better place, whether that's around mental health or climate change, uh, DE&I. These are all very important social issues that, you know, as a uh, entertainment brand, which is effectively what we are, we need to entertain our, our, our fans, but we also need to take our knowledge and know-how and and work to make the world a better place. And, and that's what gets us up every day and what we focus on. What do you feel like from an innovation standpoint, uh, you're most excited about, you know, over the last few years, you all are making uh, the, the greatest strides on? Yeah, it. Um, th there's a lot we, we do. Um, safety is something that uh, I think a lot of people take for granted, um, and it's amazing the uh, innovation around safety and, and how that ultimately does roll down to not only road cars, but we've done uh, materials around prosthetic limbs, things of that that nature. So uh, safety, uh, of course, innovation around the automobile, light weighting, um, around you know fuel, fuel efficiency, hybrid. Uh, so there's lots of areas that we're constantly innovating that are getting uh, deployed in, directly into the road car and into other uh, businesses. Well, taking a, a pivot, I mentioned um, media, and that's a big part of 
the conversation around F1 right now. Um, you know, we just had the the big deal with Disney and ESPN uh, for media rights. Obviously, I'm sure you, you you might even be tired of hearing about Drive to Survive at this point. But but you know, it's great for the sport. Yeah, huge for the sport. You know, Netflix has done a lot to to really open up American audiences eyes. Um, and then you even look at like Apple with the, the Brad Pitt, Pitt uh, program that they have coming out. And I think they're doing like a doc with Lewis Hamilton. And there's just like all this interest, whether it's, you know, fiction, scripted, documentary, you know, just broadcast rights, like all these things are happening. Um, what What do you think of the way that the, the media relationship has evolved, especially as someone who has been in this game for decades and probably remembers a time where it's maybe a little bit harder to find F1 or you had to, you were like the hardcore fans. They had to know where to look and stuff like that. Now it's, you know, it's approaching like a mainstream saturation. And, um, you know, how, how did you see that come to fruition? You know, how does an individual team perhaps like play a role in how all of this comes together? Um, just curious about your thoughts there. Yeah, it's it's been an a, a amazing. I mean, it, the sports. Uh, of course, I'm biased, and I followed Formula One my entire life. Has always been awesome, but it was always kind of a free to air broadcast. You push out the product, and there wasn't really a way for the fans to engage. And now, with the way uh, media is going, and social, and digital, and the Netflixes of the world were able to show how cool our sport is in the many different facets. People love it because they like it's global. They like the speed and technology. They like the drama. They like the business. There's so many different ways to engage with our our sport and all these different media platforms are letting us kind of tell the Formula One story. If you want to watch the race, you turn on the broadcast. If you want to see the the theater and the drama, you, you turn on Netflix. If you want to uh, kind of just get into the moment of kind of the fantasy of, of Formula One, you're going to go watch the, the Brad Pitt, uh, the Brad Pitt movie. And I think all these things are collectively contributing to the, the growth of Formula One. And I think it's uh, awesome and it's long overdue in, in specifically in America, but we really now have a foothold there. Yeah, how does really though? How does it? How does it feel for you personally? Like we we know the bigger conversation, but like Zach Brown from California grew up loving motorsports, and then all of a sudden this thing that was maybe a little more niche, you know, it was, it was always popular, but it was definitely a little more niche, and now it's like the coolest thing out. Like, how does it feel? Do you feel like I told you so? I knew I knew this day was coming. I think it's great. You know, I, I think back to, and I'm still uh, probably the number one fan of, of motorsports, but I think back of, of how uh, much I wanted to meet the drivers and the team and see behind the scenes. And so I think coming back to, you know, one of our big focuses of our fans, I feel my responsibility, part of my responsibility is to, to, to give access uh, to, to the fans. And if I can do that via, uh, myself, you know, engaging with fans or doing TV shows or Netflix, you know, I just love to share this awesome sport and McLaren that we have with our, you know, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of, of fans around the world. And it's a, it's a privilege to do it and thrilled that it's as popular as it is. And I think it's only going to get more popular. We haven't had Las Vegas yet. The new TV deal that you mentioned hasn't kicked in yet. And these are things that are going to just continue to propel the sport forward. Yeah, you were you out? Were you in Vegas um, for like the kickoff? No, I've been. I've, I've I went out a few months ago to to do a site inspection, which was um, not much of a sight to see yet. Yeah. But uh, I saw their vision, and they're going to put it together great. Uh, we had uh, Daniel out there, um, but I wasn't out there myself this last weekend. But I of course followed it very uh, very closely. Yeah the the car like going through the casino. Yeah, as everyone cool. talking uh and in general i mean i i'm working in sports there's so much happening in vegas now so i've been out there a few times this year every time I'm on the strip i'm like this is really gonna happen <laughs> like it's, it's gonna, gonna be unbelievable it's gonna be incredible so now so we got las vegas grand prix uh we just had austin a few weeks ago and of course that is continuing i actually 
I'm talking to uh, someone from the circuit today about, you know, some different stuff that they have going on. Obviously they have their own things that they're excited about as a venue. Um, so we have that. And then we have Miami, which kicked off back in the spring. We're in full swing there. So not only is there just like this idea and concept of mo- the rise of motorsports in the U S it's happening. We have three Grand Prix now, <laughs> Grand Prix. So what what is that like specifically? I mean, I've seen some quotes from you in the press, and I, and I'm sure that you get asked this a lot. It's like, yes, it's it's super hot right now, and it's never been so hot. But but I guess where do you think it's going? Like, what does this all ultimately mean? Um, do you think that we look up and you know F1 is is pulling in more viewership than some of the other traditional you know American sports, or just like where is it going? We know it's hot right now, but as someone, you know, who really has a, I think a closer insight than a lot of, a lot of people, like just where do you think this is all is headed? Uh, I think it's just going to get hotter and, and, you know, I do think it's going to close the gap to the major sports in, in North America, which is, which is great. Um, you know, if you look at the TV ratings, they're still relatively small, so they're growing fast. But if you look at, you know, what an NFL puts up as a TV rating or an NBA, you know, there's a lot of room for, for growth. You know, it's massively popular now with two races. We've got a third coming. You've got a great sports broadcaster who has made a significant investment, and you only make a significant investment if you intend to put uh, more significant investment and in, in resources behind it. So I think TV ratings are going to grow. I think you're going to add another – one third to the, uh, the the U.S. calendar from going from two races to to three races. I think we'll eventually see a U.S. driver. Uh, I think Williams is trying to kind of get uh, uh, Logan over the the line uh, now. Uh, you've got a lot of American companies that are embracing the sport. You know, in the last few years, we've we've been fortunate to partner with Google and Dell and Cisco and Coke and you know Goldman Sachs. These are all huge U.S. companies. Yeah. That soon as they throw what they're doing, their their marketing weight behind it. So all these things are going to come together, and you sit there and you, you actually kind of feel like Formula One's just getting started in, in America. And uh, so I think there's a lot of room for for growth, and and I see a lot of staying power here as well. So I'm I'm very bullish on Formula One, and, and definitely in North America. Yeah, sometimes it's as exciting as 2023, 2024. I think the deal starts with ESPN in 2025. But it's like, this is like a 2030s conversation. You know, it, obviously every year counts until then, but we're really, this is like, where are we going to be in a decade, you know, after all of this groundwork that we've laid now? So definitely totally. an exciting time. My My son is like a... He's like you back in the 80s. Like, he loves his cars, his motorsports. So I'm excited that this is happening in his youth, you know? Because we cool. could, we turn on the TV every weekend. And he, I mean, he's like, God, Formula One. <laughs> I wasn't it's doing cool that sport. at three years old. But um, so shifting gears a little bit, I know that you are a big uh, collectibles, memorabilia guy. Um, like, you know, you have your own car collection, but I think you're also into other sports collectibles. Can you, this show is, is partially just about hobbies, passions, you know, the things that, that make you who you are outside of your, you know, day-to-day job. And obviously I'm talking to people like you so much of, you know, your focus is going to be just on your work. I'm sure that's just like where your heart is. Um, But I do want to hear about, you know, these, these other pieces of your life and and maybe even how they inform the work that you do. Yeah. um, I'm I'm a big car collector, but that's probably uh, uh, an obvious thing to, to guess. I also, uh, I, I love, uh, baseball is is my uh, favorite sport and something I would have liked to have done as a as a professional. Uh, I like ice hockey, I like tennis, I like golf. So those particular sports uh, I follow uh, pr- pretty pretty closely and really more on the baseball side because of the history of the sport. Uh, got a lot of baseball bats from 
dating back to Ty Cobb and Babe Ruth and Mickey Mantle. And, wow. Um, so you and, must and be then, stoked to see a Mickey Mantle sell for $12.6 million. It was crazy. It was yeah. crazy. You, you and, got one uh, in the stash over there? You're about to I take used, over I the used, Sotheby's? I used to uh, I used to have a bunch of baseball cards, but uh, now I'm, I like to hang stuff on the on the wall. So, you know, sports jerseys, Wayne Gretzky and things of, of that nature. And then I'm also uh, a, a historic document a collector. So I have all the U.S. presidents and the prime ministers and you know, the Davy Crockett's and, wow. and Civil War and things of that nature. And I uh, kind of, as I mentioned earlier, didn't do a lot at school. So I almost relived my uh, history class uh, through through historic uh, collectibles uh, and have some pretty cool stuff with some pretty uh, awesome content. So that's that's one of my uh, one of my passions. Are you um, holding on to everything right now or have you like I just saw like a Michael Jordan's last dance jersey sold for 10.9 million or something like are you getting in the mix with all this like frenzy of sales or are you just going to sit No, tight? I'm 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 a buyer and, and enjoy I mean it's, it, they are unbelievable uh investments um so it's it's good to know it's great to have a a passion it's uh, I love wine but you know, if you're kind of a wine collector and you drink the wine, it goes from being worth a lot of money to being very enjoyable, but it's not worth anything. Where uh, some of these other collectibles, you can put them up on the wall, you can look at them, you can think about the history behind them, you can imagine, you know, that person, George Washington, penning this document, and it actually just keeps going up in value because uh, George has done uh, signing. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, so it's a great way to really enjoy something. So I, I buy these out of pure enjoyment, um, but but also know that they they you know do go up in in value. So they're also uh, very good investments at the same time. Yeah, definitely. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you, knowing that you you know you're an American guy, but you live in the UK too, right? Correct. Okay. In so, in uh, in uh, in Surrey, not far from the uh, the factory where I am uh, as we speak. Okay. So, curious. You've been back and forth for a long time now. Um, just what do you what do you think of? I guess how the the relationship and the culture between the states and the UK, or even the states in Europe at large, has uh, has developed. You know, our, our society has become more globalized. Um, there's always been a lot of exports, right, between music and the pop stars and certain films and fashion. There's always been this, like, back and forth conversation. But as someone who's been able to chart it for decades, um, just, like, what do, you, what do you think that relationship is um, b- between our cultures? I think um, we, we both kind of learn from each other. I'm, I'm very happy that I've uh, spent uh, what I've been here now uh, 10 years and uh, lived here uh, for a few years back when I was racing. So I think I've had the best of both worlds, which is being born and raised in, in, in America. And then, you know, I absolutely love uh, England, everything about it, the, the history, the culture, the diversity. Uh, so I think I've been fortunate to kind of have the best of both worlds and same thing for my uh, sons who are now uh, both back in America at, uh, at college uh, having them kind of grow up in, in Indiana and see, you know, how America works and its values and then come over to, to, to England here. They were here, you know, seven, eight years and get to see, you know, it's such a hotbed England for, you know, the French and the Italian and the Middle East and Germany. And so it's, it's a very diverse uh, city. And I think ultimately uh, it makes you a more, uh, rounded individual, if you can see how different people live different parts of the world, because these cultures are, are, are vastly uh, different. And I think if you embrace it, it makes you a well-rounded individual and appreciate um, people's different perspectives uh, on life. So I've been uh, very fortunate with my travels to be able to, to meet uh, great people around the world. Yeah, I love it. It's an inspiration to me. Like I, I want to find some way in my life to at least, you know, get out and just be an expat for, you know, a year, five years, maybe, maybe if I'm lucky a decade like you, but I I feel the same way. It's just, I've always been the type where I just want to see new things, you know, like I'm, I'm open, whatever it is. Um, 
when it comes to back to McLaren, the fact that you've raced, like, how does that inform what you're able to do as an executive? Um, do you feel like, you know, you have, you have a different perspective because you've been in a seat yourself? Um, yeah. And I think there's a lot of, uh, I've taken from being a driver that is applicable to, to business. Um, you know, teamwork, trust, communications, when to give orders, when to take orders, um, you know, when to make big decisions, uh, when to take risk, when, when to play it safe, um, how to, how to play the short game, how to play the long game. And so I think, uh, racing given that I'm in the racing business, I think it's, uh, there's a lot of things that it's kind of taught me on how you work with, with, with people, but also have a deep understanding of, of what, uh, what a successful racing team looks like. Cause I've been around a lot of very successful racing teams, the most successful racing teams in the world. And then I've driven for some that uh, are, are less great. So I, you know, I know what great looks like. I also know what bad looks like. Can you uh, get into some of those like kind of, I guess, values that you, that you spoke about? Like when you say when to take risks or when to give or to take orders, we have a lot of, um, you know, aspiring entrepreneurs or may not even aspire, you know, a lot of executives, I'd say from kids in college to CEOs of biggest companies in the world, like that's kind of the audience we're dealing with FOS. But a lot of people, um, I think, get a lot out of just hearing people like a Zach Brown or some of the other guests that we've sat down with just share their perspective on life and business, like the things that you hold close to you that have kind of like kept you on track throughout your career. So with all those things that you said, what are a couple that you're like, all right, I've learned this over the years and I, I stick by this, you know, and, and it's done me well. Yeah. I think, um, you know, one is don't make the same mistake twice. Um, you know, you learn a lot from mistakes, but if you make the same one twice, which can happen from time to time, um, then you didn't learn the, the first time. Uh, so I, I think learning is, is critically important. Uh, knowing when to listen. Uh, when, you know, is when, that? You, when, when is that? Um, when you uh, don't know something. Um, there are some people that see it as a weakness um, that they don't know everything. I think that's a strength. How can you possibly know everything? So knowing when to, to shut your mouth and, and listen and ask for advice and give people an opportunity to to share their, their views. Ultimately as the CEO, you need to you know, make the decision, but it needs to be an informed uh, decision. Uh, and you, it's hard to listen when you're, uh, when you're talking. Great advice. <laughs> Definitely. Um, you know, sometimes, sometimes you just need to hear it from someone directly like that to, to really let it sink in. I think that, I think that's the case with a lot of things. It's like, you know, you need the, almost like the, the practical in the moment to, to really be able to like internalize it. And yeah, it's, it's always just nice to hear that. No matter how much you know it, it's nice to hear from someone. Um, so from a, from a business standpoint with McLaren, like, again, we know that this is, this is what it's all about for you driving, like you said, a profitable team, you know, making sure it's, it's a good business on top of a good team. So what, what does that look like? I don't know how specific you can get, but like from a revenue standpoint, from, a, you know, any, any numbers that are out there, you're able to share, like, what does success look like for McLaren racing from a business standpoint? Well, u- u- ultimately winning races and, and winning the championship, we've been uh, bouncing around between third and fourth in the championship last few years, fighting for fourth. As we speak, we uh, won our first race in quite some time. Uh, last year, but you know, as as a, a sports team, whether you're a baseball team or a, a Formula One team or a basketball team, uh, you know, in sport, it's all about all about winning. Um, you know, that's that's first and foremost. And then, of course, our our shareholders. You, you know, sports teams, you, you you build value through building the, the franchise value as opposed to you know free free cash flow. So. Obviously, uh, you you want to drive a, a profit, but where you drive the most value for for shareholders is um, by a, a good bottom line. But you know, 
as important, if not even more important, is the results of the of the sporting team because that then drives uh, brand uh, popularity. That's why the you know the Yankees will be worth more than. I don't want to pick on another team, but you know, uh, no, maybe dude, a, the Cowboys a, a, are worth eight eight billion. They're the most valuable team in the world, and they haven't been yeah. pretty. They haven't been good in quite some time. No, but they got a great a great history. But you got to keep it going, and that's really well, and that's what I mean. That team. that value, that history. No one even second guesses. No one's like, oh, they're losing. Why are they worth so much? We know why they're worth so much. Exactly. Exactly. Well. I guess that puts that that makes me wonder for McLaren, you know, you're definitely trying to prioritize, you know, getting those wins. But how do you is it is it the history, the legacy? Like, how do you drive value if you're not, you know, coming in first place? Um, what yeah, what, I mean, what are the main things you do to try to keep the business, you know, where it needs to be, even if the results on the track aren't always where you want yeah, to be? Yeah, keep, keep, keeping your fans engaged, growing your, your, your fan base. Um, you know, you do a lot of that uh, digitally. We were the, the in the most recent survey, the largest ever survey done in Formula One. We were voted the most popular team with the most popular driver lineups, uh, driver lineup. Lando was most popular with uh, the, the youth and the, and the female audience, which was great. And, you know, we've accomplished that while we were third, fourth in the championship. So, uh, you know, like all sports, no one wins uh, all the time. And so uh, the way you maintain that popularity is by being a very engaging and exciting racing team. And you can still do that without winning, but eventually you got to win. Yeah, of course. What's your relationship like with the drivers and, and with the crew? Uh, you know, obviously you're again CEO, but seems like you have a very like hands-on approach. You, you, yeah, you... the drivers are the stars of our our sport, so I've got a a great relationship with them, and we uh, we we take our job very seriously, but also recognize that we're racing cars for a living, and that's a, a that's a fun thing to do. So we have some you know fun together, and uh, same thing with the with the crew. I think it's a great uh, you know sports or uh, kind of a unique. Uh, business and uh, you know you gotta have fun together and celebrate together and pick each other up when you have a bad day at the office so to speak what are whether it's uh, you know a fun story or or something that just kind of stands out like when 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 I have conversations like this a lot of times someone in your position you've been doing this for a long time so things that maybe you know, young Zach in the Valley in the eighties would have been like, Oh my God, I can't believe that this is going to be my life in 30 years is now just like everyday life to you. Um, but at the same time, do you, do you have a couple moments? Do you have a couple things where you're like, okay, like this is incredible. You know, this is something I'm going to remember forever. Um, and and yeah, one, you probably pretty, have a, pretty, pretty pretty much every day. Yeah, I was about uh, to say everything, but yeah, there are a couple highlight, things yeah. that like like if you're having dinner with someone and you're like, okay, you want a cool story? Like, here's one thing that kind of still blows my mind. Yeah, winning in um, Monza has to be uh, my my highlight, especially that it was a it was a one two. So being on the uh, the podium, celebrating our first win. In, in an iconic venue in, in Monza and, and doing it in the one, two, that, that definitely uh, to date is my most memorable uh, uh, experience here at McLaren and, and in professional, uh, professional life. Nice. You've been, um, you've been really vocal about the cost cap drama and, uh, you know, do, how do you feel about the way that that has been, I guess, addressed in these past couple of weeks? Um, I, I think, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a very important topic. It, uh, uh, we need to keep costs under control and, and keep fair play on the, on the field, so to speak. A lot of other sports have some sort of uh, cost controls to, to bring kind of balance and fairness. And, you know, there was a breach. I think the FIA uh, addressed it uh, appropriately and, and quickly and, I think we'll all, you know, learn from it and and hope that uh, you know no one repeats that again because no one wants to see uh, what what happened. Uh, it was unfortunate. I don't believe it was intentional, um, but but it needs to not happen again. Yeah. Does there? Do you just kind of move on? Do you have like? Because I say this because you've been someone who's been vocal about it. Like I, I wonder, are you? You know, do you do you call up someone and it's like a problem and it's like like does it get 
personal? Does it get tense or is it just kind of like, yo, it's part of Every, business? Yeah, no, everything in Formula One's pretty, uh, pretty, pretty tense. So that, uh, you know, you definitely got to speak up. Otherwise, uh, you know, if uh, people don't uh, take things seriously, then they'll continue. And I think everyone takes it very seriously. I think the, the, the team that, that broke the cap, they took it very seriously. So, uh, um, but that, you know, the, the, the political side of our sport as uh, captured by Netflix is a big part of our sport. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's part of, part of why so many of us are, are becoming fans and falling in love with it. Like realizing that it's not just cars going around the track. There's a lot of personality, a lot of story, a lot of theater. Um, I think it's been great that the audiences have been exposed more to that. It's a big, it's a big part of why it's intriguing. Well, with the, you know, the final, is around the corner. I can't believe this year flew by, didn't it? We're already, we're already, you know, a couple of weeks away. But but how are you? Um, what are you, what are you expecting as twenty twenty two closes, and I guess going into next year? Um, you know, what what are your thoughts on where the team stands and where you think that you all will be going in the near future? Well, we just need to continue to drive forward. We still have some technology, that uh, infrastructure that was put in place, specifically a new wind tunnel and, and simulators. So as fast as our sport moves to catch the people in front is not so easy because they're not standing still either. So uh, we have a, a, a new driver and Oscar Piastri joining us next year. So we need to get him up to speed and uh, hope that we put a good uh, good car on the, uh, on the track. Nice. Well, Appreciate your time. Um, one more thing before we get out of here. Looking big picture from a from a business standpoint, everything that you've seen and accomplished in your career. Um, I love some of your advice earlier about just, you know, when to listen, when to take risks, things like that. But, you know, what would you what would you say to someone who who loves motorsports or loves anything and really wants to like take a path to to be able to pursue it professionally or you know to take their love of something to the next level um we know all the tried and true work hard you know network like all these things are obvious but what are some things um that maybe be are just a little less clear to the average person that you found to be you know a real help for you um, also I've, to, I've asked people this question. They've been like, uh, oh, the truth is I have no idea. And that's how it works out for me. But, you know, is there anything that you look back or you talk to your sons who are in college or trying to figure out what they want to do with their life where you're just like, well, you know, here, here's something to keep in mind. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's seems obvious, but I, I see people, um, at times don't, uh, uh, fully understand how hard things are in life and, uh, and you can't quit and you got to pick yourself up, uh, and, and learn from mistakes. So I think you can apply that to, to whether that's motor racing or, or any other sport or business for that matter. All right. Well, definitely take that advice home. Appreciate your time, Zach, and, uh, best of luck closing out this season and, and taking things into 2023. Good stuff. Thanks for uh, having me on. Hey, it's Abigail Gentra, host of The Lead Off, where front office sports breaks down the biggest stories of the day, where sports influences business and culture. We give the latest details on topics ranging from college and pro sports to fitness and supplements. Tune into The Lead Off daily for continued updates on teams, leagues, and companies making power moves in the industry. Find The Lead Off on Apple, Spotify, and front office sports. That's a wrap on another episode of My Other Passion. I want to thank Zach for coming out and letting us know what it's like to be the big boss over at McLaren Racing, giving us some behind-the-scenes insights on this whole explosion of interest in Formula One across the United States. Really appreciate the conversation. And you know how it is. We'll be back next Wednesday with another guest. Thanks for tuning in. See you soon.